Afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our breakout session on innovating with IoT on AWS. My name is Phil Silver, and I'm a go-to-market specialist in AWS's worldwide specialist organization. This, focus, this session focuses on IoT in the public sector, which includes federal government, state and local government, state uh, education, defense, and national security. So let's start with a definition of the Internet of Things. There are billions of connected devices in factories, hospitals, cars, aircraft, buildings, and thousands of other places that are fueling digital transformation, generating huge volumes of data that have the potential to become foundational organizational assets. The source of this data is increasingly coming from billions of edge devices which can range from small, low-power devices like sensors to more powerful devices like edge gateways and cameras. With the proliferation of devices, you increasingly need solutions to connect them and collect, store, and analyze data to drive value for your business. IoT workloads securely collect, aggregate, and store data from fleets of physical assets at the edge or in the cloud analyze it using AIML tools, and enable enterprises to take proactive action based on actionable insights. AWS offers IoT services and solutions to connect and manage billions of devices that let you collect, store, and analyze IoT data for industrial, commercial, and tactical edge workloads. They enable innovation by providing the most complete set of IoT services from secure device connectivity to management storage and analytics, AWS has the broad and deep services you need to build complete solutions. AWS IoT secure your IoT applications from the cloud to the edge, providing application device security and connectivity across all workloads and, select and security levels, including classified data for defense and national security applications. We make devices more intelligent by bringing artificial intelligence, machine learning, and IoT together, creating models in the cloud and deploying them to devices at the edge with up to 25 times better performance and less than one-tenth the runtime footprint. Finally, AWS IoT enables you to scale easily and reliably, build innovative, differentiated solutions on secure, proven and elastic cloud infrastructure that scales to billions of devices and trillions of messages. From industrial operations to defense and national security to humanitarian assistance and disaster response to smart cities, AWS IoT is making a difference, whether driving operational excellence for supply chains, delivering sustainability for, bu for buildings and campus management, or providing situational awareness at the tactical edge. Our speakers today will share just how they are doing this. Brian Cobb is the Chief Innovation Officer for the Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport, commonly known as CVG Airport. CVG has been serving commercial customers since 1947, with more than 7,700 acres of land, four runways, a diversified base of operations on or near the campus, along with an economic impact of approximately $7 billion. Matt Johansson is the global lead for AWS disaster response. His team has been using AWS IoT and edge computing in response to major humanitarian assistance and disaster response missions, providing situational awareness at the edge. This is the same IoT technology that can enable decision support in forward operating bases at the technical edge. Brian, let's hear about CVG's IoT journey. Phil, thank you, and uh, great to be with everyone. Super excited to share our journey and our story about how we're partnered now with uh, AWS collaborators and really accelerating technology, particularly IoT uh, capabilities and moving forward into the future. Many of the themes that Phil shared early on is what you'll hear 
what we're doing in practical applications. And I suspect you'll find yourself kind of immersed into our story, really as a traveling consumer, probably some of you as you traveled into this summit in particular. Uh, despite all of the, the capabilities that are happening in aviation and where we are today, we're still dealing with adversity. And I suspect some of you probably had a delayed flight, perhaps or two, coming in. Uh, in particular, some of you were probably standing in a queue line or two in particular, uh, which is incredibly frustrating for us. But once upon a time in our storyline, there was an aha moment where we found ourselves working with an IoT solution back in the day. And I do say back in the day. IoT was a buzzword, many of you know that. Uh, we actually had to just kind of cut through the buzzword uh, issues and frankly just dive head, headlong into it and really try to figure out what is IoT, what does it mean for us, and how do we actually practically deploy it into an airport environment? And we'll share that element to really try to educate uh, not only us, but educate the industry as to what it meant at the time. And then really we'll share what it means to actively operate in an airport. And really what I would in, implore you to really kind of appreciate is that an airport is really a micro city if you really think about it. It has many of the factors and facets of a city, which ironically creates an environment for us to create really what amounts to as a massive laboratory opportunity. So that's really where we've accelerated with our AWS partnerships. And then ultimately, with those partnerships, we're influencing not only the aviation industry, but taking those opportunities, taking those uh, circumstances where we're using technology um, in practical applications and deploying them well beyond the aviation industry uh, in, into uh, numerous opportunities. And then the future forward advancements, and you'll see some familiar uh, opportunities and situations there. The villain, there's always a villain in the story, right? Uh, I suspect many of you have uh, picked up the papers over the last weeks, and again, uh, some of you flying into the summit. Similar themes, uh, baby transportation is back, right? But unfortunately, the villain is back, and those are the lines. Uh, sadly, uh, go back to the Passover and the Easter holidays, uh, all the way back to, any of you traveled to South by Southwest? If you are not familiar, I see a couple hand, hands go up in the air. If you're not familiar with what happened, something as simple as someone returning a rental car, one person returning a rental car south by southwest, panicked. They open the door, they get out, and they run because they thought that something was going on. And when they did that, it created a ripple effect. And sadly, when it created the ripple effect, everyone else started dropping off the rental cars, not even parking the rental car into the rental car facility. That ripple effect led all the way to the security checkpoint. Security checkpoint started tripping up, and suddenly you have a two to three hour wait time in Austin Airport, something that had never happened before. And it took quite a long time to recover that airport. Totally took the airport by surprise, and unfortunately, that's on the heels of a really prestigious conference something that no airport wants to go through when you're successful in luring a conference like that or like an AWS summit into your environment. So those are subjects that we're always um, suspicious of and that we have to keep an eye out for. That's where it comes to our brand. When an airport has, to, has an opportunity to work with a conference of that nature, a conference like an AWS summit, that's our brand that's front and foremost. Our brand never wants to be associated with hell. Keep that in mind. We had a hellacious situation once upon a time, and that's where they are first dipping of the toe into IoT. And what was it? Simply put, we had a single checkpoint, pretty simplistic, four major carriers at the time going through that single checkpoint, but it was just the airlines and the TSA. Anyone from the TSA? All right, this is good. Everyone going through the single checkpoint, and it was finger pointing. Simply not our responsibility. 45 minute wait times, typical. And that is not acceptable for a mid market, mid market like CVG. The airport got engaged, and back in the day, frankly put, 
the airports didn't view themselves as that being an airport responsibility. Airline responsibility, TSA responsibility. That was unacceptable to us. To us, as CVG, those are our friends, families, and neighbor. We're going to involve ourselves. So in that scenario, uh, you know, working together collaboratively, as nice as that sounds, was not going to work. So we really uh, went to market, tried to find technology. Technology in the industry wasn't prevalent, uh, did not existent. So we just started looking abroad and we found a solution that actually existed in Europe and it was a Bluetooth sensor, but we were kind of standoffish because it wasn't from industry and I suspect some of you have dealt with this before. So we were reluctant to kind of trial it. This is where we actually went to our university partners. So if some of you participated in the last conference, University Connected, uh, we went to one of our university partners, asked them to test it for us, and we were blown away by the data. Simply put, it was a Bluetooth sniffer. So we put sensors in our security checkpoint, and we sniffed for Bluetooth devices. So if your cell phone had a Bluetooth enabled, uh, or if your Bluetooth was enabled on your cell phone, it was picking up that signal. We didn't know who you were, but it was simply plotting dots on a virtual map behind the scenes that we could start extrapolating that data and we could start figuring out time differences. And when we could figure out the time differences, what does that amount to? Now we could start figuring out what the wait times were. And we could start averaging. We could start figuring out uh, the median, et cetera. So again, data, measure, start uh, um, really, again, the, the last, uh, last session, you can start really describing what the issues are. You can start figuring out what the, uh, not only the descriptors, but ultimately the predictors. And that's, uh, frankly, where we ended up. And with all of those data sets, we were able to go back to the airlines, and in particular the TSA, present them with the amount of information and actually a simple schedule change, a simple schedule change eliminated our QA times. IoT worked. We ended up being the first airport in the country, by the way, to display our security wait times and to publish it on our website. Suddenly, uh, that became a hit across the country, and now it's pretty much a standard for all airports. But unfortunately, the villain is back. So this is our security checkpoint, and this is typical almost every day. And why is it back? Once upon a time, uh, we were a hub airport. If you're familiar with CVG, uh, we were a hub airport for a major airline. Uh, economy of scales, things change, business decisions were made, uh, CVG was on the back end of that deal. It happens. Um, the, the business model at the time was a connecting hub. And if you're familiar with that, that means is basically if you're connecting, you're going from one aircraft to another. At our peak, we had 22 million passengers. Pre-COVID, 2019, our top passenger amount was 9.1 million passengers. That's a big drop, right? See some head nods? But what, why are we dealing with security checkpoint issues if we had that dramatic of a drop in passenger volume? Well, now we're an O&D market, origin destination. That means the vast majority of our customers, over 95%, by the way, are coming through the front door. Our facilities were never designed for that amount of volume coming through the front door. So when you start doing the math, basically, back in the day, 20% of that 22 million, that's roughly about 4.4 million passengers at most were coming through our front door. When you do 90 to 95% in an O&D market, it's about 8.1 million that are coming through the front door. We essentially doubled the amount of volume that's coming through the same footprint today. That's problematic. Uh, and it's not a situation where you can just throw millions and, and frankly billions of dollars at a situation where the economy has kind of changed and you're kind of landlocked, so it's not a situation where you just want to throw cash at it. In this scenario, what can we use technology for? And oh, by the way, 
when we do talk about the complexity, let's not forget that micro city scenario. So think about Gotham, that city. From just a sheer expansiveness, remember Phil said 7,700 acres. The purple outline is the 7,700 acres. The red outline, that's downtown Cincinnati. That gives you a sense of scale of just how big CVG is. And adding to the good complexity, and I do say good, is although our, our business model changed from connection hub to an O&D hub, we are a major connection hub for cargo. So now, supply chain. We've gone from mass passenger operation to mass cargo operation. So we're actually about 60% or so on the cargo side, 40% on the passenger side. So who are our cargo carriers? Oh, by the way, CVG is the only airport in North America to have two major cargo carriers hubbed at one location. We're the seventh largest cargo hub in the US. We're the 20th largest cargo hub in the world. Now those stats might not necessarily sound incredible, but the rate of growth is astounding. Just kind of throwing that out there. Uh, and we can probably anticipate CVG being top three within the next several years. Why is that? If you go to the immediate south of that map, there's a nice white uh, concrete area. That is DHL, world's largest cargo air carrier. DHL's been a great partner of ours for many, many years. They're already expanding another 50 acres to the south. So CVG is their second largest hub in the world. We're very fortunate from that perspective to have them based with us. And then that large swath of area just to the west that's kind of brownish, that's construction. That's, that's another carrier called Amazon Prime Air. You may have heard of it. Uh, Amazon has decided to make CVG their first mega hub. So incredibly fortunate from that perspective. And CVG is also their base of operation for their air coordination center, air, uh, air operations center. So, uh, and oh, by the way, out of that 7,700 acres, Amazon has optioned off 1,200 of those acres. So that's about 900 football fields. It, it's gonna grow big, so when I say seven largest in the US, it'll only continue to expand. We need technology to support us, right? So we continue to grow. So this gives you an idea of what we're dealing with and why we need technology to support us. This is a two hour window ticketing curb front in the morning, uh, the security checkpoint on the right. You also see our uh, wait time monitor that we shared earlier. Uh, on that wait time monitor, the pre-check, TSA pre-check is the left number and the right number is general boarding and those numbers just continue to fluctuate. Those are frankly abhorrent numbers, and by the way, they're not accurate. And I'll explain why here in a minute. Suddenly you're gonna see the camera on the right, the security checkpoint camera, it's gonna swing to the right, and uh, if you're a passenger that's flying out of CVG, uh, full on anxiety there, I suspect many of you have been in this situation, that's actually looking at the front door. So how many of you walked through the front door of an airport and you saw a line like that and you started freaking out? Am I gonna make my flight? That is not a good scenario. And when you are responsible for an airport operations like I am, you're responsible for a brand, that is not a good feeling. <laughs> because I can appreciate the fact of you have an important reason for why you're stepping foot inside my home, my house, uh, you have a reason for why you're there, and it's probably pretty critical. We have a responsibility to deliver for you, and an anxiety-ridden type scenario is not a good situation to start off with. So again, this is why technology is super critical. And here's where the hero comes in. We've moved forward with uh, IoT. One of our great AWS partners is TaskWatch. TaskWatch uh, started with us some time ago. Again, basic sensor technology, but sensor technology on our restrooms, uh, cloud computing, sending information back to wearable solution to our housekeepers. 
And that's essentially telling us when we need to go into the restrooms to clean the restrooms to keep them to a high quality state. Again, as a traveler, I think you can appreciate a high quality clean restroom is a good sign. Uh, our, our restrooms are exceptionally clean, very fortunate from that. But Bharat from Taskwatch came to us some time ago, introduced us to um, AWS's IoT capabilities, specifically machine learning, and shared, here's the next wave. Don't have to change your camera system. It's a back-end uh, platform that we can basically start programming it to look at any scenario that you want. And this is the, this is the astounding, like, unlimited ice cream shop that uh, gets me giddy. Uh, let me know, Brian, what you want us to look at. We program it pretty darn quickly, and that's in the other critical element, and we can start really kind of chasing after it. So the camera doesn't necessarily move very fast, but you will start seeing boxes show up around the vehicles. Remember that curb front camera view that I showed you on the ticketing curb front? We have a similar issue happening on our baggage claim. You're looking at baggage claim right now. So this is just our, our uh, pre-stage demo, and essentially what's happening is a vehicle stays too long, it outstays its welcome. In the past, vehicle outstays its welcome, our yellow vested agent walks over to the vehicle, engages in a conversation, asks the customer to move, and it's a 50-50 shot. That customer on the bad 50-50 would say, I've not been here too long, who cares? And they subsequently get into an argument and it's not a good experience. Again, that customer really is a guest of ours, so we would prefer not to get into an argument, but we really need them to move along because if they stay too long, guess what? It starts to create congestion and we suddenly get a traffic jam and think about that eight million passengers, those you know, passengers are arriving, so it creates a log jam at our arrivals phase. By design now, what happens is if it stays too long, the camera system takes a snapshot of the vehicle and it's a timestamp and it sends it to the watch. Our agent walks over to the vehicle, engages in the conversation, and instead of banter back and forth about time perception, shows them a picture of their vehicle with a timestamp. It's amazing what happens when you don't have a difference in time perception suddenly that argument goes away. We've managed to really eliminate that whole argument. And this gives you an idea. This uh, camera on the left is what happens when we use the TaskWatch um, solution, and on the right is when we don't. Yes, there's a little bit of a time difference, but it's about the same volume of uh, flight activity. You'll notice on the left, it's pretty much a steady state flow of traffic. On the right, yeah, traffic's moving, but it's pretty much bottlenecked periodically. So not a good scenario, and it's, it's a backup. So we're just waiting for vehicles to move. What you don't necessarily see in the vehicles on the right is that it just continues to back up further on down. And what happens in our world is pretty much a lemming feature. It's really that Austin type scenario. One person stops, and suddenly you have a daisy chain of events that happens behind it. Now, where's it going in the future? This is, again, the ice cream shop, the, the unlimited opportunities that we have with the capabilities of AWS IoT. Now we're moving that camera system and we're looking at the aircraft. We can tell that system to identify all of the service features that are happening on the aircraft at any given time. And I suspect as you're sitting in the gate hold area, you want to know exactly what's occurring at any given point so we can in turn tell you if there's going to be a delay on the aircraft. What if the fueler's not showing up on time? Or more importantly, why is this the sustainable hero? If you're not aware, and you probably, when you're sitting on board the aircraft, you hear a high-pitched whine, that's something called the auxiliary power unit. That APU, auxiliary power unit, is actually burning jet fuel. Jet fuel is usually about the second or third highest cost of any airline. You can only imagine what that cost is these days. So it's about double or triple the amount of what regular uh, vehicle gas is. 
Under this scenario, we can actually see if the aircraft is using electric power off of the building. And that's the preferred methodology when the aircraft is on the ground. So uh, that's one element. And then with some camera features, we can actually see if there's a heat trace off of the APU exhaust. So start thinking about what the future holds for an airport. It's not our fuel. Do we really have to be beholden to the airline? We don't, but it's really the good neighbor policy. It's the good nature of working collaboratively on what can we be doing together to help our airline partners act more responsibly, more efficiently, more effectively, more sustainably to lower their cost of operation, improve the environmental health for all of us. Again, incredible options for moving forward. And then uh, Phil had mentioned Alexa previously. Think about really going into the future. Uh, we had approached AWS some time ago and really started talking about what is the future of intertwining the TaskWatch solution and potentially Alexa. In a supervisory environment in our world, a supervisor is typically looking at any number of aircraft operations. It's impossible to, for one physical person to look at so many aircraft. Under this scenario, think about machine learning being your supervisor. And if Alexa suddenly becomes that supervisor and then moves into a push type messaging. So Alexa noticing that the fuel truck is missing and can immediately call the fuel operator to let them know, where are you? You need to show up. Incredible opportunities forward looking. And then ultimately the digital twin. It really is building the future into the cloud and getting into that predictive state and what it is to be meaningful, make meaningful change into the future. We have a, an incredible opportunity to truly, uh, truly enhance what it is to build in the cloud with all of these capabilities that we've shared so far. And Matt's gonna share a few in just a few minutes. But why are we so uh, focused on really um, the IoT capabilities that are coming at us? Because ultimately, you deserve a better experience as a traveler in the aviation industry. And by gosh, we're gonna do our best to deliver it for you. So thank you, and really looking forward to seeing you hopefully uh, fly through CVG. And with that, we'll turn it over to Matt. Thanks, Brian. I had no idea what IoT was doing to help us travel better. My name is Matt Johannesson. I'm the global lead for AWS Disaster Response. Yes, I'm the one who brought the Jeep into the building upstairs. So if you guys haven't seen the Jeep, please come see us. We actually have a live version of some of the concepts that I'm gonna to share today about how we're using IoT out in the field to support humanitarian operations, disaster response, and first responders. So. Uh, just a quick uh, couple of points that I wanted to cover today. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about what the AWS Disaster Preparedness and Response Program is. We're gonna talk a little bit about a new mechanism that my team created for going out into the field as much as possible to build with things like AWS IoT at the edge and in the cloud. We'll talk a little bit about a use case around augmented situational awareness and I'll just start pulling toys out of my pocket and we'll talk about this and my radio, right? And then uh, we can also talk a little bit more specifically at the technical level about the AWS IoT Core using LoRaWAN, AWS IoT Greengrass, and the AWS IoT Core, both in the cloud and at the edge. So a little bit about the AWS Disaster Preparedness and Response Program. Uh, we are part of the AWS Global Social Impact Team, and our program's mission is to support communities throughout the disaster life cycle, whether it be preparedness, actual response, or the recovery after something like a natural disaster. We also aim high to improve access to AWS technologies, provide our technical expertise, and volunteers to deploy alongside of our partners uh, during their own responses. Um, if anybody has any questions beyond what we're able to address today, really encourage you to stop by upstairs. My team is standing by. We've also got our director of operations here in the crowd, Christy Rhodes, who just gave a great talk and a great overview of the program. I'm sure she can answer your questions as well. So 
This uh, mechanism that I mentioned, the field test exercise program. I tell people all the time that if you're gonna help people innovate in the field for something like disaster response, it's really hard to do with the latte and the AWS console in your home office. You have to go out into the fields. You have to put uh, your boots on, be willing to get muddy, and so what we did was we created something called FTX, or the Field Test Exercise Program, where we go out for two to three days at a time with our customers and partners and work backwards through hard problems like disconnected edge, limited bandwidth, and all the things that first responders and humanitarian organizations deal with when they actually go out in the world to help. We do this on private property so that we can have access to things like open airspace and uh, you know, really not have any limits on what we can do with things like RF technology and putting together end-to-end -end solutions is a lot easier to do in an open space. We have access to approximately 4,000 acres when we do this. So if we wanna simulate multiple teams responding at once using different networking capabilities, different satellite backhaul, 3G, 4G, 5G, all the LTE, right? We can do that on this piece of property and we're really excited, again, to share those use cases with you all about how we're augmenting with things like AWS, AWS IoT, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, we frequently also uh, use AWS Snowball Edges. Not the topic today during this presentation, but if anybody has any questions about disconnected edge, uh, either whether it be EC2 or S3, and what the device itself provides, we have two of them upstairs and we're happy to walk you through, so please come by. So, the use case that I wanted to spend just a few minutes on, and this is maybe a little bit more technical, uh, but I'll try to walk everybody through it. What are we doing with the AWS Core, IoT Core for LoRaWAN, AWS IoT Greengrass, and the AWS IoT Core in general? So, we heard from customers a really hard problem. I'm sure everybody's seen, uh, either in person or through news media, what first responders are dealing with out in the field. It's usually a very chaotic, very stressful situation. There's usually a lack of everything, as we say. And one really challenging problem is to keep volunteers safe during a response effort. You're dealing with different types of training background, different levels of experience. So the question I have is, how do you take a sensor like this, which is on the left side of this architecture diagram, it's a $50 LoRaWAN, you know, long range, low power IoT sensor, and put a dot on a map alongside something like this commercial radio, which something like a first responder or a government agency employee may be carrying with them, right? How do you do that quickly? How do you scale it? How do you make it so that uh, any organization, or not even any person, you could, we've put these on vehicles, we've put them on UAVs, we've put them on boats, right? All you need is a zip tie or some duct tape and you get a dot on the map. So architecturally, when you have backhaul, meaning you've got some way to connect to the internet from the field, whatever type of wide area network you have, the goal is to get the signal from this sensor, which takes GPS in and then communicates over LoRaWAN to a gateway, which is just another IoT device that is connected to the internet, into the AWS IoT core. And what we're doing is natively using the AWS IoT core to manage these devices, the device gateways, the security aspects where the, uh, the certificates are actually generated from the cloud and put on the gateway to manage the uh, complete chain of security, and then pushing that data into a compute workload, whether it be a VPC where you've got an EC2 instance that can use data coming from this sensor, or maybe you're just using a Lambda function to push it to another web service, which is actually the demo we're doing upstairs where we're using a Lambda function instead of an EC2 instance to push to a partner who hosts something called the Android Team Awareness Kit. Anybody in the room ever hear of something called ATAC? No, no ATAC post. It's uh, moving dots on a map. So imagine being able to, again, put this sensor and my radio in the real world on a map in real time. So that's what this architecture is all about. And when you have connectivity, the great thing about it is that you can see these dots from this sensor anywhere in the world, right? Because it's in the cloud in the AWS IoT core. So what happens when you don't have backhaul, right? There's no cell connectivity after a major hurricane event or after a tornado, right? And our telecom partners are working hard to restore connectivity, but you don't have any. And you can't get your SATCOM working that day. Right? Maybe there's clouds or 
other interference. Um, what you need to do is take the AWS IoT core to the edge using Greengrass. So we can take the exact same architecture and deploy it to the Snowball Edge. Now I can use just my local area network. I don't need to focus on internet connectivity. I can run everything at the edge. So again, if you come by upstairs, I'll show you how we're doing this with just simple switch gear that you can buy at any big box store and a cradle point router for LTE connectivity when we have it, right? If you need to run it at the edge, it's a great option. And we do it all the time. We actually simulate pulling the plug on our WAN from time to time to simulate what our customers and partners are dealing with during these responses. So just a little bit of data here. We actually uh, tested this POC uh, recently after we changed some of the architecture to use Lambda, like I mentioned, where we went out with a partner to a large search and rescue event in uh, Hampton Roads, Virginia, where we had over 30 different responding vessels during a maritime search and rescue exercise. And I'm here to tell you that our gateway, the IoT gateway that I mentioned, again, it's a device with a couple antennas on it, it's about this big. The altitude of that antenna was approximately shoulder height on the shoreline of Virginia Beach here. And we saw upwards of 10 plus miles of range from this sensor. It's $50. If we had three or four gateways positioned in this area, we'd be able to cover tens of square miles reliably and inexpensively using just this sensor. So we were very happy with that. All of the data actually lives in the cloud with respect to who's carrying the sensor or what is carrying the sensor. The sensor itself only communicates its sensor ID, the lat long, timestamp, and a couple of other RF properties. There's no privacy information on this device whatsoever. That all happens once it gets into your cloud environment or into your edge device, something you control. So that's very important because what we did, we developed an, a simple application in the cloud to manage that attribution. And what does that mean? It means you can reassign this sensor. So there's barcodes on these and QR codes. Simply scan it and you can reassign it to someone else or something else, right? So another example of this outside of the search and rescue example is um, looking at when we deployed for a tornado response last year and we needed to keep track of several volunteers who were coming from different locations. We simply put the antenna up handed out 10 sensors, and we had dots on the map in a place that we had never been. Same goes for uh, supporting uh, refugee locations where you might have vendors showing up for, uh, for a short amount of time in a place where they've never been. How can you provide, say, security officers the data that they need about where those groups are? You can do it very quickly with sensors like this. So much like Brian talked about using IoT and machine learning to augment what, say, the camera can see, we're doing the same thing to fill in gaps for things like situational awareness where uh, we're not relying only on the more expensive hardware that are traditionally used. So I think I covered a few of these, but just a couple of highlights. Um, again, LoRaWAN, hands of folks that have played or seen LoRaWAN. This is really an emerging protocol, right, for um, getting long range, low power out of these IoT devices. We're really excited about this for humanitarian use cases because it truly is a global protocol and the performance is astounding. This device in my hand has three AA batteries and we get over 10 miles of range out of it. We're seeing dots on the map upstairs from me on this stage right now, even though I'm in a basement, right? Um, and just a quick point about LoRaWAN, I'm sure some in the room have read the documentation about it, but for my radio professionals in the room, the reason it's so performant is because it uses a very large spread factor. So what that means is it tries to communicate a very small payload, meaning eight bytes of information or so, over a very long time horizon. So what we've seen is incredible performance through mixed terrain, buildings, and just very long distances. So what you read on the internet about LoRaWAN, I'm here to tell you is true. And it's cost effective, so this scales. We can 
um, show these reference architectures to other larger groups and have them invest in positioning those IoT gateways where they need to be ahead of time. So if you imagine something like hurricane season and typically hard hit areas that deal with flooding, simply positioning those IoT gateways ahead of time so that other groups can bring sensors like this to quickly interoperate with local, state, or federal agencies is something we're trying to get the word out about. Um, connectivity is not always required. So again, the ability to go to the edge and bring this capability without needing a firm connection to the cloud is very important. And then we're using all open source technology here, right? So the demo you can see upstairs using the Android Team Awareness Kit is completely open source. There's no licensing associated with it and only a couple Lambda functions in order to get dots from the sensor on that map. That's actually all I had, Phil. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Matt. So we deliberately left some time for Q&A and would welcome questions from you. Uh, are these devices already FCC approved or? They are, yeah, and um, it, I just also want to mention that uh, the device in my hand, is this is not an Amazon produced device. Uh, we, we buy these off the commercial market. So as far as uh, compliance and testing, we leave that to the device manufacturers. This is considered a commodity device from our perspective. Any questions? Thank you. What's the lifetime of your three batteries? I think that's one of the most popular questions. So I hate to say, but it depends. Um, these, sen these sensors are configurable. So you can plug a cable in and you can configure the way it behaves. So for example, when we put it on a UAV or a fast moving uh, vehicle, we like to turn up the frequency by which it um, transmits. So we go to like a, a one second duty cycle. So every one second it will transmit. If we're doing a lost hiker scenario where somebody's on foot and they might be uh, simulating what a search and rescue team does, we'll turn it down so that they can get more battery life. So you might transmit only you know, once every five minutes or so and that is good for that use case. So it does depend. Now what I can tell you is from our testing with UAVs, uh, we've seen good you know, daylight operation for a three day period, even at one second duty cycle. So pretty good. And this uses just AA batteries. Um, and the frequency that it transmits on um, actually depends depending on what region of the world you're in. Uh, each uh, regulating body has a different frequency band for LoRaWAN. If you don't have one, I'll ask one. <laughs> Go ahead. Also a good one. Um, so we have a smaller version of this sensor upstairs. Um, again, I can, I can share details of who makes these. Um, we've also seen some white labeling of the chip itself that does this, which would probably be the smallest form factor. So if you have another device to embed the LoRa transceiver, you can get even smaller. Again, this is just what one vendor did to package it up into an IP67 case. So I'll ask Brian a question. Brian, eight or nine years ago, CVG was the first airport to install physical Bluetooth sniffers in the security area so you can tell people how long the wait was. But that didn't work anymore when the lines went all the way to the front door. How did you solve that problem? or Why didn't you just install more hardware? Damn it, Phil, there's a cost to everything. <laughs> uh, as simply put, um, when you're in a confined space like the security checkpoint, it's somewhat predictable with those Q-lane straps of what direction people are going to go. So with the Bluetooth Wi-Fi sniffers, uh, it's all based on proximity. Once people are outside of the security checkpoint, it's anybody's guess as, as far as what direction people are going to start queuing. So we, we, we really lose uh, that capability unless you anticipate walking into an airport, and some of you have probably done this, 
uh, airports just start dropping in Q straps everywhere. And, and that becomes an absolute nightmare trying to navigate where they are, particularly when you saw what happens for us. Suddenly there's a line and then suddenly there's not. So what do you do with all of those ropes and straps when, when you don't need them? Um, so no need to go that direction. Where to your point, um, where we do have that capability now with our partnership is using the, uh, the machine learning, the camera technology, right? Uh, so absolutely now we, instead of putting up Q-straps and additional uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi sniffers, we can use our existing CCTV and uh, enabling the, the camera systems and starting to look at where are the cues and evaluating what's happening and sync those two systems together. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, with the airport, is there um, is there camera technology for detecting lost luggage, or perhaps like baggage to identify like which cargo is where? Oh man. <laughs> uh, lost luggage from what perspective? Because there are different types. Like you leave from an airport, right? And your luggage does not go to your destination. Do you think like the airport could use like cameras to detect where it was last seen? Or if yeah, so remember, uh, there are, there's the airport and the airline. Uh, airline is responsible for the, the check luggage aspect. And really the airline has the, the tracking capability. Airport, every airport is separate from the next one. Now, absolutely we are interested ultimately on what happens if there is luggage left behind. In our scenario, if luggage is left behind, then really what does that mean or imply? Uh, you probably have heard the messaging. It's, it's an unattended bag. So now we have a security threat. Those, those are the types of scenarios that we're keenly interested in. Now, if we can help the airline identify missing luggage, and we've done this uh, initially of identifying when was the last time we saw that particular bag if they have not been able to trace it based on the QR code or the SKU code that's on your bag tag, um, there are opportunities to do that. But it's a, it's a continual build too. Uh, so there certainly are opportunities going forward in the future. Thank you. And the collaborative effort for sure. Matt, how does somebody ask for our services and get them when there's a disaster or a need for humanitarian response? Well, the first thing we ask is for people to reach out and get involved. So if uh, our customers and partners are building their own capabilities and we need to help integrate either by making them scale or uh, making them more approachable to more groups, one of the things that we do is enablement on our team. Uh, to make sure that those reference architectures and solutions are uh, known about, used, tested, et cetera. Um, in terms of actual volunteerism for uh, the response activities or the disaster response team at AWS, um, we typically leverage our partners to call us into the field and we join their response. Um, and it really varies uh, kind of on the situation, the type of support that we'll provide. Um, every response is different and a highly dynamic situation. Question over here. Yeah. David, correct? Me or? The airport, Matt, David. Brian. Brian, I'm sorry, I apologize question about sharing the data with the Department of Transportation in and around and, around and about the uh, airport environment. So absolutely a, a necessity. In fact, um, right now one of our big pushes is, and I, I was sharing with Phil and, and many of the AWS teammates, is that how great would it be to call all of that data, not just from one airport, but from multiple airports, and to be able to get into a predictive state and to be able to share that with multiple regulatory agencies. Frankly, it starts with the TSA. Um, it, very frustrating, and by the way, US segment is not the only one. European segment deals with the same issues. Uh, just like I shared with the other gentleman, there are airlines and there are airports. Airlines are very reluctant to share their information for competitive purposes. So uh, despite the frustration, airlines are reluctant to share their passenger loads. Even to this day, I as the airport 
I have no idea how many passengers are coming at us at any given time during the operational day, which also implies that our TSA colleagues, while they have a ballpark number, they specifically don't know what's going to happen at any particular time. And then there's also an aspect of not everyone shows up at the same time. So some of us prefer to show up two hours ahead of schedule as preferred. Others prefer to show up like right before the aircraft door is closing. So there's all of these uh, incredible nuances that that's where this calling of the data, it's analyzing the data and watching what is happening on these cameras to really start learning what's occurring in real time and starting to get into a predictive state that like our, our colleagues before this presentation, you finally get to a prescriptive environment. And again, it's not just one airport. How great would it be that we could actually share that across multiple environments? Because there are implications, not just to the airports, but to our regulatory agencies. Think about the concessionaires. It's just, it's, it's almost a never ending feed all the way into um, supporting agencies well beyond the, uh, the campus, the airport campus. Think about the hoteliers, et cetera. So, it's an amazing opportunity, but it is a long time in coming and something that we frankly talk about year after year, but really uh, what AWS is putting before us with these capabilities is just phenomenal that we are finally, finally starting to just crack and chip away at the ice, iceberg. And, and I know from what you've shared with me, Brian, that with all of the development around CVG, you've had to work very closely with your county and state DOT partners because of the great increase in traffic, the expansion of roadways, so you can even get trucks or cars in and out of the airport. Yeah, for, so for those of you that may have heard the, the Long Beach presentation, um, we are in a very similar situation. So I'll actually be contacting the Long Beach folks uh, where it's not just an airport type of situation for us. We have to start figuring out how to be ground traffic control. Why is that? So for that large scale of an Amazon operation, they anticipate two to 300 trucks at the Amazon site at any given time. That's just the Amazon site. That doesn't include the DHL site, and that doesn't include uh, all of the maintenance hangars. That doesn't include the, uh, the employees that are operating on the south side. So you can only imagine the amount of growth that's likely to happen over the next decade as those 1,200 acres are just being developed for one operator, let alone all of the operators that are also going to be constructing sites. Um, the amount of pressure that that's going to be putting on the roadway system uh, and the implications that that has for, frankly, the environmental issues, uh, sustainability opportunities. So again, it's the thread that just, you can continue to pull it, but the opportunities that are being presented, frankly, at this conference are almost unlimited as far as what we can do to be getting out ahead of that to start evaluating how we can improve, and all the way down to including Matt's presentation about working on disaster response, something that we have to be engaged in too. So if there's no more questions, first of all, I wanna thank you, Matt and Brian, for demonstrating how both at, in the cloud and in the edge, we can deploy IoT technologies to make a real difference in people's lives, uh, whether it's traveling on an airplane and having a great experience at the airport, or whether it's actually saving lives uh, after a natural disaster. So thank you very, very much. Don't get up yet. I'll ask you to bear with me for just a couple minutes of housekeeping and to uh, uh, complete a survey. So first of all, we want to encourage all of you to get engaged with our training and certification content today. You can scan one or both of these QR codes to get started with your cloud skills, training, and certification. Skill Builder is our online learning center that makes it easier from any, for anyone, from beginners like me to experienced professionals to build AWS cloud skills. We have 500 plus free digital courses that can help you and your team build new, new cloud skills and learn about the latest services when and where it's convenient. And we do that in up to 16 languages. Within Skill Builder, take advantage of flexible learning plans which offer suggested digital courses aligned to a specific domain or job role. And as you build your skills, consider preparing for one of our 11 AWS certifications 
These are industry recognized certifications that span foundational, professional, and specialty levels to validate AWS knowledge and skills, building your credibility and confidence. And we invite you to join the AWS certified community, which brings together AWS certified professionals from all over the world. Once again, we want to thank you very much for your time and attention today. Uh, are here at any time to answer any questions you have. I want to encourage you to visit the Gladiator vehicle up on the level above us and to learn more. And our last ask is please complete the session, session survey either by scanning here or in the mobile app. It's very important to us to hear what you have to say so that we can constantly iterate and improve on sessions like this. Thanks again.